So we are very happy actually to have together with us uh, today, Professor Tobias, Steve Tobias from the University of Leeds. And Steve, as you may know, is an expert in fluid dynamics with application to astrophysics and nonlinear phenomena. Steve uh, got his PhD from the University of Cambridge, where he worked under the supervision of Professor Nigel Weiss, and his thesis was uh, on the solar and stellar dynamos. Now he's a director of the Leeds Institute of Fluid Dynamics, and before that, he before actually coming to Leeds, to the University of Leeds, he was a research fellow in mathematics at the Trinity College, uh, Cambridge, and a research, a research associate at the University of Colorado. Steve has made significant contributions to the study of magnetic field generation in the sun and the explanation of the solar activity cycle. And today he will be talking to us about the dynamo generation of astrophysical magnetic fields in general. And without any further ado, Steve, the floor is yours and we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Maria, and thank you for the uh, nice introduction and the invitation. As I was just saying to Maria, I apologise for, I was meant to be giving this talk in November, but I did get COVID, so Maria graciously uh, moved the talk uh, to today. So thank you all for bearing with me. Um, this talk is not going to be incredibly technical. I think you'll all be glad to glad to hear. It's uh, it's going to be mainly a review of, of what, uh, what we know and what we don't know about the generation of astrophysical magnetic fields. I'm very happy if you want to interrupt to ask questions, that's good. Right at the end, I'll talk a little bit about some methods we've been trying to use, uh, which, although uh, we haven't applied them to dynamos as yet, I think could be applicable to astrophysical fluid dynamics in general, uh, so maybe of interest more, more generally. So what I'm interested in, and I'll spend a lot of time reviewing the observation, is the generation of magnetic field by what's called dynamo action, and I'll explain what a dynamo is, in stars, planets and galaxies, all sorts of astrophysical objects. Um, so here we have a movie of the sun rotating around. I'll talk a lot about the solar magnetic field. This is a galaxy, a spiral galaxy. Uh, central question of galactic magnetic fields is really where, how can this magnetic field have such a large scale systematic component, why isn't it all small scale? Uh, before I start, I should uh, thank the people who paid for the research, uh, mainly the European Research Council um, for, for the award of an advanced grant. Uh, it's very nice, it's coming to an end in a couple of years, which is a bit of a shame, but uh, yeah, we'll see what we can do. Okay. Okay, so my central question really is, how can an astrophysical object such as a star or galaxy generate a systematic, and I'll explain what I mean by systematic in a minute, systematic magnetic field at high magnetic levels? Um, it's, it's not really surprising that a, a, an astrophysical object can generate a magnetic field, as we'll see, but how can it generate a systematic magnetic field? So how can it overcome its tendency to be dominated by fluctuations at small scales, which is what you might expect something to do at high magnetic Reynolds number. Uh, and the second question, which is a subsidiary question and I hope to get to at the end of the talk, although you know, time constraints may not let me get there, is a, a question that, given that we can't really simulate astrophysical objects, I mean, anybody who says they, they're really simulating an astrophysical object doesn't really know what, what they're doing. So given that we can't really simulate uh, astrophysical objects with any fidelity, uh, can we devise uh, methods for capturing the scales uh, our numerical simulations can't resolve. So we have a finite amount of computing time or a finite amount of computing power. We can only resolve uh, a certain amount of scales. A general question in fluid dynamics, astrophysical especially, is what's the best way of apportioning our resources uh, and can we do something about the, the bits we're missing? So I hope to get a little bit on that. So for those of you who want to have a, a, a nice sleep, uh, Pretty much everything I'm going, to, I'm going to say will be covered in one of these uh, four review type articles or books. Um, so anybody who wants to know anything about dynamos should have a look at this book, this book which has been brought up to date. It's Keith Moffat's famous book on dynamo theory. It's been brought up to date very recently by Keith and Emmanuel Dormy. That's a very nice book which, which contains all the subtle technical points of dynamo theory. If you're particularly interested in stars, um, uh, then there's a nice review recently about uh, 
by Sasha Brown, uh, Matt Browning on really generation of magnetic fields and stars. Um, uh, then there's these two uh, lecture notes, if you like, um, which have been brought out uh, recently. Uh, this one by Francois Rancon is nice in the sense that it also covers plasma dynamos. And then there's this one uh, in Journal of Fluid Mechanics by me, uh, which has the advantage of being free to download. I recommend you do that. And, and virtually everything I say will have been will be covered in, in, in this review. OK, so when I'm talking about astrophysical magnetic fields, I'm really talking about planets, uh, stars, galaxies, anything astrophysical. So if we start with the Earth, I'm not going to spend much time talking about planets. But we know that the Earth has a magnetic field currently. Um, we know we can work out very quickly that the ohmic decay time, that's a time if there were no inductive motion in the, in the Earth's interior, uh, to sustain the field, we know that the Earth's magnetic field would decay on a kind of time scale of 10 to the 4 years. And yet we know that the Earth's magnetic field has been around essentially to the age of the Earth, and it has all this amazing dynamics, it has these reversals, so the polarity of the Earth's magnetic field reverses kind of irregularly, some people think it's stochastically, uh, but one thing that's for certain is that the Earth's magnetic field has been around for a lot longer than the ohmic decay time of the, of the field in the Earth. And so we need some kind of uh, dynamo process, something that sustains the magnetic field against the actions of ohmic dissipation. Uh, the, the correct non-dimensional parameter for determining how, um, um, dynamo, uh, how efficient dynamos are or should be is the magnetic Reynolds number, which I'll come to recently, uh, come to in, in the future. And um, in the Earth, the magnetic Reynolds number is roughly uh, uh, order of a thousand. So we'll see that has implications when we come to have a look at what magnetic Reynolds number is in stars, galaxies. Okay. Uh, we can move on, we can have a look at galaxies. Now galaxies, there's a slightly different problem. Here's a, an, just an example of a spiral galaxy uh, and galaxies are right at the other end of the spectrum. So galaxies, for a galaxy, the ohmic decay time uh, of the magnetic field in the galaxy is greater than the, very much greater than the age of the universe. And so there is no compelling reason um, a priori for why the uh, galactic magnetic fields should be generated by a dynamo could just be a primordial fossil field. Just based on that argument, you might think uh, that it could be a primordial fossil field, but people who do galactic uh, dynamos, and I don't really do that very much, they argue that the nature of the, of the magnetic field that you find, the, the, the large scale nature, as you can see here, sorry, let's get my mouse working. Here's, here's the uh, magnetic field vectors, uh, that are found in this spiral galaxy. This is a systematic large scale magnetic field. It's not all on very small scales. And it's this nature of the magnetic field that we think means that, uh, that this is generated by a dynamo. We'll see for the sun a bit later that the sun's magnetic field, again, we have to appeal to other, um, other arguments other than the ohmic decay time to say that it's, it's, it's a dynamo that's generated. OK, now we've talked a little bit about planets. We can talk about, uh, we talked about the Earth. We can talk about other planets and just even going to uh, uh, solar system planets. We know that uh, all, the planet, all of these planets, Earth, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, they all have magnetic fields with different characteristics. Uh, and um, uh, one thing to notice is that the uh, magnetic field uh, that you that you find, you can see uh, the properties down here, which I've put down here. Um, the 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 properties of the magnetic field uh, really depend on the rotation rate of the star and other properties of uh, sorry of the planet and other properties um, such as the constituency. Of, of the planet. And we'll come back to that a bit later on. But the key thing for dynamo action or large scale dynamo action is going to be uh, rotation. Um, rotation is going to be the breaking of the symmetry that leads to uh, the ability to generate large scale systematic fields 
and not just small scale random fields. And you can see down here, I've put down the rotation periods of these, these planets. Some of these are rapid rotators. In fact, all of these are fairly rapid rotators. Uh, the Earth, of course, rotates uh, round once a day. Jupiter is a, is a very rapid rotator, rotates around uh, every nine hours. We'll see this in a minute. Uh, and you can see these other, these other planets with their rotation periods. Interestingly enough, Saturn's magnetic field uh, has a tilt of the magnetic axis to the rotation axis, which is indistinguishable from zero degrees. That proves to be a problem for, for reasons I won't go into in too much detail. Um, for dynamo theory, dynamo theory says that actually this is not possible. This is not possible. Um, and so there's an awful lot of uh, discussion about uh, how Saturn's magnetic field gets generated. Of course, um, this is the field we can see. Uh, and so most, most of the arguments about whether how Saturn's dynamo gets around the so-called anti-dynamo theorem uh, is to do with the magnetic field of Saturn that we can't see. Okay, let me move on. So as I said, rotation is going to be really important here. And you can see the rotation rates of these bodies. Uh, Earth is a pretty rapid rotator here. So you've got Uranus and Neptune rotating around, and you can see the obliquity of the rotation axis. Jupiter is a very rapid rotator, as you can see. You're getting some ideas of the sizes of these objects as well. And here comes the sun, which we're going to talk about mainly. The sun is quite a slow rotator. You can see in comparison with, um, say, Jupiter here, the sun, as we'll see, goes around roughly uh, once a month. But of course, the Earth goes around once a day. So it's about 30 times slower. Uh, but rotation is going to be important. What it's going to do is give a handedness to the, to the convective turbulence that leads to the generation of uh, a large scale field. You can also see the changes in, in, in length scales as well, or, or spatial scale, okay? So, you know, Earth is somewhere down here. So I'm not talking, I'm not gonna talk about planetary dynamos. I just wanted to say uh, that when people are trying to do computational models of planetary dynamos, um, we, we are closer to being able to just do a computational model. Uh, here is, a, a, the, I would say, the state-of-the-art computational model uh, from uh, the group in Paris, from Julian Aubert. And what they're doing is they're doing simulations of uh, Boussinet or anelastic convection in a spherical shell, interacting with a magnetic field at a rapid rotation rate. Uh, and you can see... Um, we can get very beautiful pictures of um, of the generation uh, of, of fluid flows, uh, changes in the density and magnetic field. Um, these, these, these things are not really rapidly rotating. Though. So all the problems that you find for planetary dynamos and the geodynamo come from us not being able to solve the momentum equation correctly. I'm going to contrast that with stars. stars we're not even in the in the regime where we can begin to solve the momentum equation, although people do. We're still having trouble solving the equation for the evolution of the magnetic field, the induction equation. Um, so, so the we, we are somewhere with planetary dynamos. We have a lot of interesting results. We can get dynamo, we can get dynamos that reverse. We, we're trying to understand whether they reverse for the wrong reason, but they do reverse. Um, so that's that's interesting. Okay, let me move on to what I really want to talk about, which is stars. So the sun's magnetic field has an ohmic decay time of about 10 to the 9 years. And these, this is some early uh, pictures from Galileo. Galileo uh, drew, did uh, use the invention of the telescope to do some sunspot drawings. And if you put them together, you get a nice movie showing the sun rotating and these dark patches on the surface of the sun. This is manifestations of the underlying um, magnetic field, as we'll see a bit later. So these dark patches are dark because the magnetic field that we see at the surface is inhibiting the convection and therefore uh, appears, appears to be darker. OK, so some other early drawings. Again, uh, this is drawings by Hevelius in the mid-17th century. 
of sunspots. And you can see, going to a modern day image of, of, the, uh, of the sun, uh, similar kinds of behavior. This is a sunspot pair, or sometimes called an active region. You can see in more detail here. This is the manifestation of magnetic field buckling up from under the surface. It buckles up owing to an instability called magnetic buoyancy. Um, and what you see is that there's um, uh, different polarities in the sunspots here. So this is a magnetogram of the surface. And you can see uh, blue and green is field of one polarity. And red and yellow is field of the other polarity. And so what you see with the sunspot pair is the fields of opposite polarities. And if you think about this as a magnetic field which is buckled up, it's an underlying uh, toroidal field going round and round the star, which is buckled up through the surface. And then you get a patch of uh, two different polarities depending on whether it's coming into or going out of the sun. And this is what we use to really look back and see what the magnetic field of the sun has been doing uh, in the past. So let's have a look. This is again a magnetogram of the solar surface. Uh, and we've just changed color scheme here. So yellow is magnetic field uh, pointing out of the sun. Blue is magnetic field uh, pointing into the sun. And what you can see here, uh, the first thing to notice is that in the northern hemisphere of the sun, all of these bipolar regions, these patches, are, have a yellow leading a blue. So that's magnetic field of a certain polarity, whereas in the southern hemisphere, it's blue leading yellow. Okay? And so the magnetic field, the toroidal magnetic field in the sun, has an opposite polarity in the northern hemisphere than it does in the southern hemisphere. And this is the signature of a dipolar magnetic field. So if we play our movie as to what the sun's magnetic field does, I'll play this a couple of times, we're going to see what's called the solar cycle. But in the solar cycle, sunspots appear at middle latitudes, which you can see here. And then as the solar cycle progresses, the sunspots or the, or the, the location of the sunspots moves towards the equator. The cycle dies out. Here's the cycle dying out. And then a new cycle begins with sunspots appearing at mid-latitudes and moving to the equator again. Um, I'll just play it again. And unfortunately, it's been a bit cut off, this screen, this uh, thing, uh, this uh, color bar. But you, hopefully you can see that this goes from uh, 1980 to 1990 to 2000 to 2010. So we had about three cycles worth in that uh, movie, we'll do it again, and uh, about 30 years. So the, the solar magnetic cycle is, is 11 years. Uh, the other thing to notice, and you can only notice this when you're looking for it, is that the polarity reverses every 11 years. So if you keep an eye on the, on the say, the northern hemisphere, you'll see here blue is leading yellow in this cycle. We'll wait for everything to die out. And when it comes back, yellow is leading blue in the northern hemisphere. This means that the whole the sun's magnetic field is flipping every 11 years, which is very different from the Earth, which was flipping every 100,000 or, so, or millions. In some case. So whatever dynamo process is going on in the sun is, is perhaps a bit different to the one that's going on in the Earth, uh, at least in terms of its reversals. Okay, so if you if you then can I, you're can not I worried. Ask, to, can I ask can. a clarifying question, please? You you said yeah, that we can. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. thank you. I'm Nick Kilafis. Uh, the, the uh, you interpret this opposite polarity in the northern in the southern part of the sun uh, as uh, a dipole magnetic field, right? Yeah. Yet in the yeah. sun, the dipole magnetic field uh, is uh, two orders of magnitude lower than the quadrupole ones. So how can this be a perturbation of a dipole and be a hundred times stronger? Okay, I'll come back to, no, the dipole is much, much stronger in the sun than the quadrupole component. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, the thing is, this is the, this is the toroidal field. So this is the uh, azimuthal field, which is buckled up. There is a poloidal component to the magnetic field as well which also reverses. Uh, I don't know if I have a figure of that, but 
the the dipole magnetic field is much bigger than the quadrupole. I mean, when I say much bigger, maybe five or ten times bigger. Okay, so thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I actually have a, a, a figure which, yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. So let, let me just um, um, talk about the systematic behavior here. The systematic behavior, you can see the, is these waves of magnetic activity in the sunspots, which are migrating from mid latitudes to the equator, which you can see. So this is a, 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 um, a spatio-temporal wave, if you like, which is moving from mid latitudes to the equator. And it's, this is a signature of the, as I've said, the zonal magnetic field. Okay. Um, so one question you might ask is, given the sun is a very turbulent system, how do we get this large scale uh, order? Now, um, if you then average over, over uh, latitude as well as longitude, you get, you can see very clearly the well-known uh, solar cycle here, uh, the eleven-year cycle. You can see it's nice period. Uh, you can see it's modulated on a longer time scale. Uh, so you know the 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 uh, amplitude of the cycle goes up and down. Uh, this is where Galileo was uh, looking for sunspots, and there was a period in the seventeenth century where the uh, magnetic field there weren't really any sunspots. Although we do believe that there was a uh, a magnetic field being generated, it just wasn't strong enough to buckle with this uh, uh, magnetic buoyancy instability and reach the surface. Uh, okay, it's interesting uh, to conjecture as to why this uh, the cycle is is, is modulated, uh, and that's to do with the interactions between the magnetic field and the velocity, and also why uh, periods such as this mourn the minimum uh, occur. And we'll see uh, in a minute that this is not, uh, this is not an isolated event. This, this has happened in the past. Again. So we only have a certain record for direct observations. Uh, we have some information about from proxy data about what the magnetic field was doing in the past. And this comes from uh, extragalactic cosmic rays. Uh, what happens is the solar magnetic field modulates the amount of cosmic rays reaching the Earth. And these cosmic rays are responsible for the production of terrestrial isotopes, either beryllium-10 or carbon-14. So beryllium-10 is stored in ice cores and carbon-14 is stored in, in, in tree rings. And so you can go, you can drill out ice cores, you can measure the amount of beryllium-10, and you can get um, a measure of the beryllium 10 production rate, and that is anti correlated with, um, with a magnetic field strength. So you'll see here, this is, this is the so called more than minimum, which corresponds to a maximum in the production rate of beryllium 10. Okay, and this is going back to 1440 here, yeah, this, this, uh, this record here. So you can see there are other events where at least the beryllium 10 production rate was similar to what it was in, in the moment minimum. And actually, you can go back for roughly 20,000 years and you can get a, a record of, um, of events uh, similar to the moment minima. So these are called grand minima. And from analysis of the beryllium 10, you can say various things. You can say that the cycle persists through the moment minimum. Um, uh, that these grand minima are recurrent. So this is the so-called Spora minima, which I pointed out earlier in the in the uh, 15th century. And there are various other things you can say about the solar record. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about stellar uh, magnetic fields. So, um, so the sun's magnetic field, if you were to measure it as a star, we know that the uh, uh, chromospheric uh, calcium H and K emission, sorry, the left hand side of my slide has been okay, uh, is correlated with uh, uh, magnetic field strength. Uh, and so you can have a look at the, this emission in solar type stars and you show you have a variety of activities down here. Uh, this is what the sun would look like in its H and K emission if you measured it as a star. And these are solar type stars. And you can see that you know there's there's quite a lot of cyclic activity. 
There are some cases where there seems to be a kind of minimum light activity. I don't know if this is if this is a good interpretation. Maybe it's just a very weak period. Uh, but what you can do with this, you can measure the rotation rate of these stars and try and understand how the uh, properties of the dynamo, for example, the amplitude of the cycle and the um, frequency or period of the cycle changes with the properties of the star. And what we find is that as the rotation period changes, as the rotation period increases, the cycle period also increases. Okay, so as it as it rotates slower, it take, it has a longer cycle. So again, rotation is important there. And as it rotates slower, the amplitude of the cycle goes down. So these are things that we would like any uh, theory, any uh, dynamo theory to be able to explain. Currently, that, those are two quite serious constraints for our theory. So what do we know about the interior of the sun? Well, we know, uh, well, we know quite a lot from theory. We know that out to the 70% uh, by radius, uh, then uh, the energy is carried by radiation, uh, that the energy that's produced in the interior, in the core. Uh, but then, uh, because of changes in opacities, uh, the energy will have to be trans uh, well, would have to be uh, carried out through uh, convection. So the outer thirty percent by radius is the convective zone. Uh, we know something about the interior rotation rate from helioseismology, uh, which is uh, the science of looking at acoustic waves in, in the sun. Uh, Differential rotation tends to split the, 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 the frequencies of these uh, acoustic waves. And by doing an inverse problem, we can get some idea as to what the sun's interior rotation is doing. So we've known for a long time, just by tracking things at the surface, that the equator rotates faster than the poles. That's something we know. Um, and it seems as though that pattern is largely imprinted all the way through the convection zone. And then there's a transition to essentially solid body rotation in the radiative interior. And why there's this pattern of angular uh, angular momentum in, a, in this star is not very well understood. And, you know, there's a lot of recent debates uh, about, uh, about how this works. Uh, indeed, there are other stars which are very solar-like, which have what we call an anti-solar differential rotation where the equator rotates uh, slower than the pole uh, and numerical models seems to be very sensitive as to whether you get a uh, solar-like or anti-solar differentiation. A harder thing to understand is or, or to measure is the meridional flows uh, in the sun. So these are the flows in the meridional plane this is an order of magnitude harder measurement for helio seismology to make. Uh, however, it it can be seen uh, unequivocally at the surface. We can track things again at the surface, and what we know is that there's a an equator to pole uh, flow which uh, is at the surface, uh, and then from helio seismology, these are four different inversions which are compatible with the data. But it seems that there must well there must be a return flow somewhere if all this material is going towards the pole, and these are these are four different inversions which show uh, possible uh, scenarios for what the meridian. Okay, so what I've described is uh, a, a situation where we have this very turbulent fluid, very turbulent flow, but we have a very systematic type behaviour that interacting with the turbulence. It was a very systematic behavior of the magnetic field interacting with the turbulence. And I'm just going to briefly do an aside which says, do we see this kind of behavior anywhere else in, in astrophysics or indeed in, in, in plasma physics? Uh, and of course, the answer is uh, yes. So do we, do we see this kind of interaction of turbulence with spatio-temporal order elsewhere? Uh, and one very obvious example is on Jupiter. So in Jupiter, we have a very turbulent flow and we have these bands and jets um, that are that sit there, essentially unchanging uh, over over hundreds of years. Uh, and the great red spots, so we have this very systematic behavior 
sitting on top of a turbulent fluid. And the method that we develop for uh, understanding astrophysical fluids are really ones that are very good at, de at uh, describing the uh, turbulence, the interactions of turbulence with, um, uh, with mean flows or mean fields. So again, this is another example of systematic behavior from turbulence. This is a picture from the Juno mission, uh, which uh, is still orbiting Jupiter. And that's giving us some information about whether these jets are deep or shallow by measuring the gravity coefficients around Jupiter. Okay, I just want to say, and this may seem like a bit of a, a bit of a stretch, but I, I want to talk a little bit about um, so one other one other example where uh, turbulence interacts with um, uh, with mean flows because I believe it's the same mechanism as generates large scale magnetic fields and stuff. And this is the generation of zonal flows, so called zonal flows in in, in magnetically confined tokama. I'm not going to do anything more than 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 show you a movie. Uh, and what this is 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 a is a com computational model of uh, a tokamak uh, where there's an instability that leads to turbulence. This is a very complicated uh, model. Is in fact it's a five-dimensional partial differential equation that they're solving, and the interactions lead systematically to the generation of flows in what they call the, zen the zonal direction. So the zonal direction in the tokamak is, is, is this. And if I get time at the end, I'll show you some uh, numerical simulations of th th this process using the technique that we've developed for physical flows. Looking at the time, I'm not certain I would get would get to. Okay, so let me let me move on a little bit. Okay, what about this stuff? Okay, so let's go on to some theory. So the the dynamics in the solar interior. Is governed by the equations of, of magnetohydrodynamics. And so we have the induction equation for the evolution of the magnetic field, uh, the momentum equation, okay, so Newton's uh, second law, perhaps a continuity equation, an energy equation, and that, you know, maybe we'll approximate things by saying there's a gas law, something like this. And so we know the equations, there's no difficulty in, in knowing the equations. The difficulty lies in the uh, vast range of spatio, spatial and temporal uh, scales that we have in, in a star. So, for example, uh, mathematicians like to non dimensionalize their equations. So, if you non dimensionalize these equations, you might uh, you, you get an awful lot of non dimensional uh, parameters. So, these are the typical non dimensional parameters. That you would get for the sun. So you know, if you if you have a thermal thermally driven convection, you might have a Rayleigh number. Uh, a Rayleigh number is uh, is is something like ten to the twenty. The crucial um, the crucial uh, non dimensional parameter going back to the induction equation. So the induction equation describes the evolution of the magnetic field via advection and diffusion. So if there was no advection, then the field would decay away. It would decay away on an ohmic decay time, which we said for the sun was 10 to the nine years, for the earth was 10 to the four years. Uh, the ratio of advection to diffusion is given by the magnetic Reynolds number. And the magnetic Reynolds number for the sun is something like 10 to the 10, uh, which means that advection is 10 to the 10 times more uh, efficient than, than diffusion. Uh, another way of thinking about it is an advective time for the sun is about a month, whereas the decay time is about years. Or so. uh, and so th this is this is of an order of magnitude that but there's no way we'll be able to solve the induction equation at that parameter in, uh, on a computer. There's just no way. Whereas, as I, said, as I said, for the Earth, it's 10 to the 3, and actually we can solve the induction equation. What we can't solve for the Earth is the momentum equation. So all of these uh, non-dimensional parameters, I think, can be thought of as the ratio of, of certain timescales. And all of those uh, timescale ratios are either very big or very small, except for this one, which is the Rossby number. The Rossby number is the ratio of, of uh, Coriolis force, the rotation, to advection. 
and that is roughly order one to the to, us, to the sun, uh, and uh, that that puts it in the in the regime of not really being a rapid rotating. So just to uh, to fix ideas for the Earth, this is this would be something like ten to the minus five, and so the Earth would really be a rapid rotator. And so all of these non-dimensional parameters being, you know, especially the magnetic Reynolds number, which I'm showing you here, being huge means that we can't really just bung everything on a computer and hope to get. So as I've said here, um, because of the extreme nature of the parameters in the sun, uh, and this is a common problem in astrophysical uh, MHD, MHD uh, we can't, well, we, we, we can do some global computations, but we have to be, be a bit wary about how we analyze the results. Uh, modeling has typically taken one of these three forms. You can either do try and do global computations, in which case you're you're solving the relevant equations on a massively parallel machine. So you either accept that we're in the wrong parameter regime or, or claim that the parameters invoke to some kind of turbulent viscosity, turbulent resistivity, or something like that. Or you might want to employ some kind of subgrid scale modeling uh, for the scales that you're not you're not resolving. Uh, you might want to derive some mean field models, so you derive some equations that uh, describe the evolution of the of the large scales and parameterize the effects of the small scales. Um, or you can try using low order models. And I think it's fair to say that all of these have uh, pros and cons, and you have to try and do a, do a judicious um, combination of all three. So why don't you just bung everything on a computer? I mean, talking to an astrophysical fluids audience, there's no, uh, yeah, I shouldn't really, I don't really need to labor the point. But I think this really makes the point quite nicely that it's for, the, for a star at least, is that even if the computational resources were available, so somebody gives you as much computer time as you like, the power required to simulate directly a star like the sun is 10 to the 22 watts. So that's a calculation that was done by Petri Capilla. And so this is equivalent to the luminosity of a M9V main sequence red dwarf. And so, you know, in order to simulate a star, what you really need to do is have the power output of a slightly cooler star. Uh, and so this is, this is not going to happen uh, any time soon, uh, and nor should it, I guess. Uh, so we need really need to think a little bit mathematically uh, to to kind of work out. What's... However, however, you know, this is a this is a kind of review. So I will say a little bit about what people have found um, doing these global computations. So just to say. Um, people are doing global computations of differential rotation and dynamo action in the sun. And I think a prerequisite for getting the solar dynamo correct would be to get the correct differential rotation. So again, I'm just showing you here the differential rotation as measured in the sun. And these are some um, computations, again, by Petri Capilla and his, and his um, collaborators, showing that in certain cases, you can get the equator rotating slower than the poles and in other cases, that it rotating faster than the pole. So this is this this is a simulation of um, anelastic thermal convection interacting with rotation. Um, and what happens is that if the Rossby number is too high in the simulation, you get this anti-solar differential rotation. In fact, if the Rossby number is what we think the Rossby number in the sun is, then we get the wrong type of differential rotation. So there's something we're getting wrong in these computational models, or our estimate for the Rossby number in the sun is not quite right. Okay. But I'm, I'm here to talk about dynamos, and so it's interesting to know what people have managed to find. And there's a long history to this, going back to the mid 70s. The people have managed to be doing these simulations of analastic and boussiness rotating convection, going all the way back to the Gilman in the in the mid seventies, and um, they find that they they can get nice cyclic dynamo action. Unfortunately, these early papers found uh, waves of activity moving towards the poles, not the equators. Um, but 
they're still getting uh, interesting results. These are all heroic calculations, but it's important to stress that the magnetic Reynolds number in these calculations is something like 10, 10 squared or 10 cubed, and in the sun it's something like 10 to the 10. So we're something like 10 to the 8 orders of magnitude out in our magnetic Reynolds number. But what people have found is that uh, as the level of, of turbulence increases, they had these nice re reversing dynamos at low RM. But as the level of turbulence increases, it was harder to build a large scale component. We just kept, as RM goes up, we keep getting less and less large scale components in systematic behavior and more and more small scale components. And the reversals become more and more chaotic until eventually they, they, they're hardly uh, um, um, periodic at all. It's just a kind of chaotic or stochastic kind of time scale. When people try and build in this, this uh, radiative interior, this shear flow in the radiative interior called the tachycline, that does tend to help the solar dynamo. Uh, but, they, um, but they find that there are other problems in the sense that the, uh, the differential rotation that they get is not quite correct. So it's very hard to, to get everything correct at the same time. However, things are starting to look up a little bit in the sense that if you go to even higher simulations, and again, uh, some more uh, simulations by Petri Kapila, they are starting to find cyclic reversals and equatorward propagation. Okay, but again, I, I should caution you that they are still 10 to the 7 uh, orders of magnitude out. Um, they find that. If we rotate the sun a little bit faster, we get more and more ordered fields, which is interesting. And all of these are fairly well described by a mean field theory, which is what I'll talk about at the end of my talk. Um, okay. Okay, so I'm now going to talk a little bit about theory and uh, what that can say. And this is quite technical, uh, and I apologize for that. But this is really where an understanding of the subject and what the problems with the technical problems uh, with the subject are. So I'm going to be doing mean field theory just by, just on the, what's on the induction equation. You can do it on all the equations, but the the induction equation will serve as a as a uh, an example, and it's the one it's the critical one because that's the one we can't really solve. So so what you are trying to do here is you're trying to write an equation for the large scale systematic component only, parameterizing the effects of the small scales that you can't resolve. So what do you do? You take the induction equation here, and then you have to decide what you mean by a systematic component. So you choose some kind of averaging procedure. It could be a time average here, or it could be some kind of spatial average. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, most people think of it as being a spatial average, say an average over one of the coordinates it could be. So long as it satisfies uh, what I call the Reynolds averaging rules, which makes manipulation of the equations uh, quite, easy, uh, quite easy. So these Reynolds averaging rules are such that if you take the sum of two magnetic fields and average it, then that's the uh, sum of the averages. If you uh, um, do... Uh, averages of averages of products, then you get the product of the averages. If you do an average of an average, you get the average. And if you do the average of an average times a fluctuation, you, um, you get zero. And so all you do, and this, is, this dates back really to the mid 60s, is you take the induction equation, you split the velocity up into a mean and the fluctuation, the magnetic field up, split up into a mean and a fluctuation, and then you just average the equation. So you take the induction equation, you average it, so you get an evolution equation for the average or the mean magnetic field. And here's a nonlinear term, which when you average it, splits up into two bits. So the average of U cross B 
is the average of u cross the average of b. That's a fairly trivial term because if we're solving large scale equations, we'll know those. Plus what's called the electromotive force, which is the average of the fluctuation interacting with the fluctuation. Uh, and this is the key thing to understand the EMF. The EMF is the average of a fluctuation fluctuation interaction. So as uh, going all the way back to the 70s, Moffat 78 says, there is now a satisfactory body of theory for the determination of E. The reason for this comparative degree of success can be attributed to the linearity of B in the induction equation. There is no counterpart of this linearity in the dynamics of turbulence. I mean, what we're doing here is what people do for turbulence, uh, hydrodynamic turbulence all the time, but that's a formally nonlinear equation, whereas this is a linear equation. So once you know E, if you can parameterize E in terms of your mean field, then you can only then you can solve just for your large scales, just for your mean fields. So how would you uh, work out E? Well, what you'd need is to write down the equations for the fluctuations, and I'm not going to uh, go into any details. You write down the equation for the fluctuations, and then you uh, you throw away some nonlinear terms. This is a, a sometimes called the first order smoothing approximation. And what you can do is you can write, you can do an expansion where you write E, the EMF, as a functional of the large scale, is what you know. And this alpha is the famous alpha effect of mean field electrodynamics. Uh, this is a generational term which leads to the generation of magnetic field, large scale magnetic field from small scale interactions. There's also another term which is called a turbulent diffusion. Uh, that one's less critical, but it's definitely there as well. Okay, I'm not going to uh, go into detail. However, there's a problem with this formulation, and, and this is the key problem that we're still trying to get around. And this is called catastrophic quenching. So when people write this down, they're writing everything down just solving the induction equation. And the problem is that they haven't looked at the back reaction of the magnetic field on the velocity that's generating the magnetic field. So you might say, well, when do we expect the, um, the magnetic field to act back on the velocity that's generating it? And the kind of hand waving argument uh, might you, you say, well, I might be I might expect uh, a back reaction when the energy in the magnetic field is similar to the energy in the, the kinetic energy in the turbulence that's causing the field. This is a so-called equipartition argument. So when the uh, kinetic energy is of a similar order to the uh, magnetic energy in the mean field. And if you do that, then you might say the alpha effect, this generational mechanism will get quenched it will get switched off when the field that you have is similar to equipartition. And people write down these formulae uh, for at what's so called alpha quenching. However, the, in the early 1990s, this, there was a lot of doubt thrown on this because people said, well, the, the, uh, the whole effect arises from the fluctuating field, not the mean field. So surely this should saturate or should be quenched when the fluctuating field, when the energy in the fluctuating field, not the mean field, comes into equipartition with the kinetic energy. And then they said, and the energy in the fluctuating field at high magnetic Reynolds number is much, much bigger than the energy in the mean field. In fact, the energy in the fluctuating field is Rm to some power bigger than the energy in the mean field. And this is bad news because this means that if you if you then say these things come in is when the fluctuating field comes into equipartition with the mean field, sorry, with the with the kinetic energy, then the mean field is much much weaker, and so the the the, the generation mechanism will switch off. It will switch off when the mean field is an order of magnitude uh, Rm to some power smaller than equipartition, which is not what we see. We see mean fields of the order of equipartition and stuff. And so this is a, a huge problem for mean field electrodynamics 
in the nonlinear regime. And, and if you, those reviews that I talked about at the at the start of the of the talk, uh, an awful lot of those reviews goes into very technical details about why this is important and how this may be alleviated in in stars and planets. Well, stars mainly planets. It's not such a problem. I don't really have time to, to go into details. I'm going to finish because I realize I'm running out of time just by talking about this method we've been using for uh, for doing mean flow or mean field uh, turbulent interactions. Uh, and it's, it's this um, method we've developed called uh, direct statistical simulation. So I, I'll spend the last uh, four minutes or so talking about work I have actually done. Uh, so what do, what do we do? If you want to write, if you have um, uh, a PDE, a partial differential equation, like the ones I've written down, but you want to solve, and you can only solve a certain amount, you only have a certain amount of computational resource, you might be able to solve for a certain range of scales uh, using your computer. However, you might want to say something about the scales that you can't resolve. Um, and what we're doing there is we're saying something about the low order statistics of the flow or the magnetic field, and we're parameterizing, if you like, the high order statistics. So when I say a low order statistic, I could mean a mean, like I've talked about mean fields or mean flows, um, or a low order, uh, one down from that, a low order statistic would be like a two point correlation function popular and turbulent. So you have to really think about what you mean by a mean, and we've talked a little about this, a little bit about this. It could be an average over space or time or over some ensemble of realizations, which is what turbulence theorists like to think about. Or you could think of the mean, the mean fields like mean field electrodynamics, as the solution given to you by an under-resolved direct numerical calculation. And you could think of the fluctuations as everything else, all the scales you haven't resolved. So you, you could develop an apparatus where you write down evolution equations for the means, i.e. the scales you can resolve and parameterize the fluctuations, the, the effects of the fluctuations on those scales. So those are the scales you can't resolve. So just fixing ideas. What you, what you would really want to do if you were doing astrophysical fluids, uh, is to do DNS on a very fine grid, okay? But we can't afford to do this. So the question is, can we do DNS on a coarse grid? Okay, here's my coarse grid. And then do a statistical theory, computationally, but still do a statistical theory uh, for the scales that you haven't resolved. Okay. And I'm just going to show you some examples of us doing this through a problem, which is the um, which is the problem I showed you to do with, with plasma physics. I'm not going to go into details. Anybody who's interested can ask me about details. I've got the details here, uh, but I'll just show you some 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 pictures. Okay? Well, we're going to be solving a, a set of partial differential equations uh, for plasma physics. These are so the so-called Asagawa Wakatani equations. Uh, they're really important equations for for uh, the driving of zonal flows in in Tokamak. Uh, but all I want you to take from these is we know the PDEs, and it, actually for this case we can solve them numerically because they're two dimensional PDEs, uh, and we can solve them at high resolution. And what we're going to do is compare the high resolution simulations of these PDEs with low resolution simulations plus something which is solving for the statistics of the unresolved uh, scale. So uh, the evolution equations are for what's called the vorticity and the um, uh, electrostatic potential uh, and the number density in a plasma. I'm not going to go into, uh, in, into details of what these are. Uh, you, can, you can have a look at these papers. Um, Oops. But what I'm going to show you is that we're going to get the interaction of turbulence with strong uh, zonal flows. So if we if we run the movie, 
what we're seeing here is the evolution of these variables uh, just from DNS, just from direct numerical simulation. And what you're seeing here is the interaction of turbulent flows. This is the vorticity. And these naturally interact to form these so-called zonal flows, these bands of strong flow uh, up and down. And this is the, the analog of the uh, strong uh, magnetic fields that you would see in a dynamo. Uh, okay. So the question is, how does this compare with doing a, a, direct, uh, a direct numerical simulation, which is uh, under-resolved, plus using this technique called direct statistical simulation, which I'm not time to go into, for the unresolved scale. So I'll just finish by showing this movie. So on the top, you can see the evolution of the direct numerical simulation, slightly different parameter regime here, where there's only two jets. Uh, and down below is we're doing direct statistical simulation along with a direct numerical simulation on a much lower uh, resolution run. And there's a detailed comparison here where green is the highly resolved uh, thing, which in, uh, model which includes much more spatial scales. Uh, and, the green, and the red is the uh, under-resolved model uh, with a statistical subgrid parameterization. Okay. I know that I've gone through that very quickly, but I think this is a very interesting way forward for Dynamo theory. So let me finish. Uh, I've run over time slightly, but let me say, hopefully I've given you just a, a brief review of some of the problems. I've spent most of my time talking about observations, but some of the problems that we're trying to explain using astrophysical Dynamo theory. I want to I want to stress that the problem for astrophysical Dynamo models is that we can't get to high enough RM in the induction equation. And we really need a theory for the interaction of magnetic fields on a vast range of temporal and spatial scales. Now it was, that was mean field electrodynamics, but I'm not certain mean field electrodynamics is going to be good enough uh, because of this problem of catastrophic quenching going forward. This direct statistical simulation, which I showed you right at the end, is a, is a potential new framework for the simulation of astrophysical flows. And in its simplest form, it will give the mean flows and mean fields that uh, mean field electrodynamics would also give you. But it can potentially be used as a subgrid model for astrophysical calculation. OK, I'll leave it there, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Steve, for this excellent talk. And I think that there are going to be questions. So if you would like to raise your hands. Let's wait. <clears throat> or if you have comments. Everybody's very quiet. I've uh, sent everybody to sleep. Right? <laughs> no, I don't think so. So until, uh, in the meantime, let me ask something uh, because I'm not uh, very familiar with these topics. So what is the, or what is the solution in order to, to this question of the catastrophic quenching that you mentioned? Do you think that with this DSS method, you are going to be able to, to see if indeed the, the saturation of the magnetic field uh, happens at the low value as suggested by the catastrophic quenching or not? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. So it, the, I think the people who proposed catastrophic quenching would say that's, that's a fundamental property of the induction equation at higher end. So whatever method you use to, um, to, sol to solve the equations, whether it's mean field electrodynamics mm -hmm. or DSS or whatever, th this is still going to be a problem. The question, though, is uh, okay. So the the, the 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 methods people use to alleviate this problem is it, very technical. This problem is to do with uh, it, okay. So what we're interested in is what happens as RM gets very very high. And as RM gets very very high, you're going more and more towards an ideal fluid. 
And as you go more and more towards an ideal fluid, there are, well, we know for an ideal fluid, there are certain topological invariants that mm -hmm. are in the, that are conserved. Right? So magnetic helicity for, for the ideal induction equation is a conserved quantity. And they would say this, this catastrophic quenching is, is linked with the conservation of these ideal invariants. And there's nothing you can do to get around that. Mm -hmm. And people have said, well, okay, that's true, but there are other methods for making these ideal invariants not be conserved, one of which is called a helicity flux, right? allowing things to move out of your dynamo generation domain. And so people are very interested now in, for example, in the sun, things that allow helicity or magnetic helicity to be transported out of the sun, such as solar flares, coronal mass ejections, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm what they do is they allow the field to reconnect and if the field can reconnect then you can change the topological properties of the magnetic field so mm -hmm. i i think if, if it really is linked to that then direct statistical simulation won't help well, but having said that the the, the the sun does it whatever yes. it is that the, i mean there must be something which allow i mean it, it's no use us going well the theory says uh, you can't have a large scale magnetic because you know, people just because point you... at the sun and go. Because people point at the sun and go, "Well, there's one." <laughs> but how is that working, right? So we just don't understand how it does it. I think. Yes, but uh, just following up on your answer. So, if this is like the answer that you allow for this magnetic helicity uh, to be transported away, uh, you described something happening close to the photosphere, perhaps of the sun. But dynamos right. are generated further inside in the convective zone. So, is this enough, or do you need to? I don't know. Or you well, need that, this that, magnetic that, helicity to be transported away, even even from the inside of the convective zone to the outer part. Well, I have to say that that is a, a great question. In fact, you know, I wrote a paper saying, you know, how can how can um, just doing you know things at the surface affect things that are happening deep within the sun. I mean, it, it, it's a really interesting question. And so if you go all the way back, let me go all the way back. If you, so uh, Gene Parker, who, w w you know, everybody knows is, was, was the world leading expert in, in uh, dynamos, MHD, every, well, essentially everything. He, he was worried about this problem and he was interested, so I'm just trying to get this thing uh, here. So he, he was, he, 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 he didn't really know about, well, okay, so he, what he was interested in is ways of getting around catastrophic quenching, and he proposed a model whereby you, you didn't really get rid of magnetic helicity here, yeah, mm -hmm. you got rid of magnetic helicity here, you got mm -hmm. it out of the dynamo, if you think of the convection zone as being the dynamo generating mm -hmm. uh, region, what you did was you pushed all the, all the mean field into the radiative interior, into a region called the tacticon, uh, and allowed things to reconnect there, as it were. Meanwhile, the convection zone was just getting mm. on with its, uh, with its day job, as it were, of generating mean field. And he called these things interface dynamos, and he did this at the start of the 90s. Mm. Okay. And these things have been largely forgotten about. But I think, well, you know, it's always worth reading papers by Parker. You know, he really knew what he was talking about. Okay, thank you very much. So, would anyone like to ask Steve uh, any questions? Or write in the chat if you cannot unmute yourselves. I don't see any questions. Ah, oh, I see one from Constantinos. Yes, please, Constantino. I can't hear you, Costa. Yes, Costa, we are muted. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes. So, uh, what I was thinking that um, essentially the dynamo amplifies uh, an existing magnetic field. Um, do we have a good theory that? Uh, suggests what's the origin of the uh, initial field uh, 
Um, and then from your introduction, there were some um, pictures you uh, didn't have the time to discuss that, uh, where the, let's say the dipole field was um, really off axis with the rotational axis or the galactic field. So uh, is there a general framework where we can address the uh, origin um, of these fields uh, uh, that are later amplified by dynamos? Yeah, okay, that, that was a great question. So, so, so I'm not really like, so in, in order to uh, understand where the primordial magnetic field, say for galaxies or, or for the universe comes from, then you need to know an awful lot about, you know, <laughs> you know, cosmology, quantum calculation, everything. That, and so the, the, there's a lot of uh, research done on this, which is not per se dynamo theory. It's really trying to understand where the primordial, where the initial seed field comes from. And there are certain uh, models for this. One's called the beam and battery uh, effect. Um, and yeah, there are various different models. Uh, and if you want to know about those models, you could have a look at the the, the review by Francois Rancon, which talks about plasma dynamos, which has a, a nice section on, on that kind of thing. Um, in terms of the, sorry, just coming back to the, you asked about the planets. Um, yeah, so, so, this is kind of interesting. Um, so I'm just trying... Yeah, here. Um, so, so, so yeah. I mean, the, the one, as I said earlier, that is, that is is perhaps most interesting is is Saturn. Uh, now, Saturn, as from what we can see, it has an axisymmetric, essentially an axisymmetric magnetic field, uh, which by Cowling's theorem. Uh, is impossible. The Cowling showed that you cannot generate an axisymmetric magnetic field by dynamo action. Uh, and of course, um, you know, th this is just the field we can see, right? So there must be a non axisymmetric component inside Saturn uh, that uh, is allowing us to, 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 allowing Saturn's field to, to, to stay there. Um, the question is, why is it so axisymmetric? And we know that uh, shear flows tend to axisymmetrize fields. So, so now we, we don't know much about the interior flows in Saturn, but people are, um, are postulating that there may be some strong shear flows and perhaps even stable layers in Saturn, just based on, on just trying to find ways of axisymmetrizing Saturn's magnetic field. Uh, I think I think the one that's uh, the other one that's kind of interesting is um, uh, well okay the, the Earth is obviously interesting but the one that's 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 very interesting is 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 Neptune here and and this this is not only this is very very offset uh, and so what this is I mean this is imagining that the the magnetic field is is essentially dipolar but what this is saying is that there's a significant uh, quadrupolar component and you you know that if you if you add a, a dipole to a quadrupole you'd get a hemispherical right magnetic field which is kind of what we're, we're seeing here and it's interesting to note going back to the question i had earlier that when the sun's when the sun emerged from the more than the minimum there were only sunspots in one hemisphere which tends to make us think that at that point the quadrupolar component of the sun's magnetic field was about the same uh, amplitude as the dipole, and that's why it looked like a hemispheric magnetic field. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Steve. Thanks, Costa. You let me check the chat once again. I don't see anything here. Yes, so what is your, uh, let me ask the final question. <laughs> so what is, what you are planning to do with the final, within the final years of your ERC project? I mean, what you are uh, actually researching now, the, these. these okay, so, time. yeah. So there's two things really uh, that, that we're looking at. The first is is what I showed you at the end, which is yeah. this direct statistical simulation. So we're really trying to understand the theory for how to do it, but also develop fast algorithms mm -hmm. for doing that. 
And the second thing is really to try and understand the dynamics of this layer. Let me go back to so that there's a layer at the at the uh, base of the solar convection zone for the tachycline. And then the, let me. So here at the at the um, um, inter, uh, interface between the convection zone and the interior, you can see that there's a layer where it's stable, it goes from being unstably stratified to stably stratified, and there's mm -hmm. a strong shear as well, a strong radial shear. Mm -hmm. And that's that and that's where we believe that it's a seat of the solar dynamo as well. What we're trying to understand is uh, what the dynamics of that layer is, because a, it should be unstable. There should be mm -hmm. all sorts of turbulence in there. And B, it should have spread. We, we're not quite certain how you manage to keep this, this layer so thin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's something else we're, we're trying to understand. What are the kind of instabilities you can find in, in, in a region such as which is stably stratified, mm -hmm. strongly sheared, rotating and magnetized? That's an interesting question. OK. Yes, it sounds interesting. And yeah, I think also to the younger audience here, I, I mean, if you're interested in looking into solar matter physics, that's an interesting research, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Final, final round of questions, if you would like. So I don't see any hands raised so i think so it's time to like close our session for today thank you very much steve for being here and for giving this very nice talk and hopefully we are going to see you in a, another meeting in the future in another seminar or and again thank you for joining us thank you Maria. thanks for the invitation and thanks for all joining thank you Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye.